When I first got into voice over IP more than a decade ago, I was so naive. I remember making the case, I was, I was there with uh, the old phone guys uh, that ran the PBX system. I ma made the case, I said, well, what you have there with your PBX, sir, is a single point of failure. If that goes down, you don't have any backups. And, you know, they look, <laughs> kind of rub my head and go, you young whippersnapper, don't you know our PBX system has a 99.999% uptime? And I had to stand there and calculate. I'm like, so, so how much, how much downtime is that? And they're like, five minutes a year. <laughs> I was silenced. I didn't have anything else to say because really, that's true. PBX systems do have a phenomenal record, even though they are a quote-unquote single point of failure. So how do we get close to that with the voice over IP world? Well, Cisco recommends always clustering your servers to where in almost any size environment except the smallest sizes Cisco will always say don't, don't buy just one server by two one is none two is one so in the clustering environment a, a whole preconceived group of notions come to mind because people interpret clustering many different ways some people say okay you've got two servers here they have one IP address and it, it's kind of like they're clones of each other anything done on one goes to the other or, or you think of like HSRP to where you've got a couple routers one IP address, you know all those things come to mind that's not how a call manager cluster works call manager clusters uh, take multiple servers let's just say two of them and start communicating in two different realms. One is runtime data and two is database data. So first off, both servers, let's say this is server one and server two, have their own IP address. They then begin to communicate on two different levels. First off, the database level. I'm going to go with number two first. One of these servers will become the publisher. One will become the subscriber. More on that when we look at the database architecture coming up. But essentially, they replicate the database so they have exactly the same data. Now, what's what's in there? Well, any kind of static data that you would expect in a phone system, like uh, that phone has that phone number. Uh, when somebody dials 911, route it to the voice gateway. When somebody... Uh, 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 dials 53, put them into a conference call, like a meet me conference call. Like all of that is static data. It's just, you know, the, the call manager has to look that up and be like, oh, that's what that number means. Oh, that's where that goes. Oh, that phone is not allowed to dial that number between the hours of eight and five. I mean, all that kind of stuff is sitting inside of the database. So that's one level. So all, all of the call manager servers that are clustered together, again, we're defining the cluster. All of the clustered servers have exactly the same data. So it it doesn't matter if this phone asks this server or this server, this server, he's always going to get the same exact response. Now that leads us to uh, communication level two, the runtime data. The runtime data is what's living and breathing and active. For example, if phone A calls phone B over here and is having an active communication that maybe phone B is registered with server 2 as its primary server. This is part of the runtime data. Uh, phone A is registered with uh, server 1 over there as its primary server. These, these servers speak together and they're like, hey, did you know that phone uh, B wants to call phone A? And the server 1 is like, oh, sure, I'll make that phone ring. Like That's, that's the active. It doesn't really have much to do. I mean, it, I'm sure uh, references the database to find out who phone A is, but somebody has to be communicating and, and speaking between these servers so that they know what's going on. Some of the examples of this kind of communication is phone registration. Like when a phone comes up and says, hey, I'm going to use you as my primary server. And by the way, that comes from a pre-configured list uh, where you configure up to three different call manager servers. We'll say server one, server two, and server three is your list of servers to use. Whereas maybe over here we configure his list to use server 2 then server 3 then server 1 as his list so if server 2 is down it goes to server 3 and if server 3 is down it goes to server 1 we do it like this to where we get some level of load balancing for these phones so we don't have all the phones uh, registering with this server it's getting overwhelmed while well, this one's just sitting here idle so sometimes we'll stagger the phones they need to communicate who has what phones so when, when this phone calls uh, another phone it's able to figure out what server in the cluster it currently has that phone registered uh, likewise along with this runtime data if server Server one goes down again. He's that burst into flame server. Uh, this phone jumps over and uses that one as its primary server. Sure, he's always looking to see if this one comes back online because he wants to go back to that one. That's his configured primary server. However, he's sitting at server two because that's the one that's active. 
that's what's encompassed inside of this inner cluster communication signaling. That's the protocol, but really it's just called runtime data. And that's what clustering is all about. Now, this is something the servers just do. When you join them to the cluster, which happens during the installation, you know, you set up the publisher server first, and then you start joining these subscribers to it. You don't really have to say, oh, oh, replicate your data. That's just what they do. That's what happens behind the scenes. And when the phones are starting to register and they're all sitting on, on this server and you start saying, okay, I want some people to use this server, the, the servers just figure it out. They communicate together with this runtime data to figure out, oh, okay, well, then we need to have some kind of signaling that makes it all happen. So think of this is like when we pull back the curtain, this is what call manager is doing behind the scenes just because we as a network administrator came in and said, these guys are going to be configured in a cluster. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.